Working Cows Podcast, episode 297. This episode is brought to you by Sunshine Bible Academy. This episode is also brought to you by Ranch Right LLC. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the C90 Ocean Minerals studios. And I'm excited to welcome officially today a new sponsor of the Working Cows podcast, uh, Sunshine Bible Academy. Now, in in full disclosure, this is where I graduated from high school. I went there one year as a senior uh, because I wanted to be there because I saw the value that it delivered to some of my peer group, and so I pursued it, and and the Lord provided, and and I went there. And so uh, their advertisements are mostly going to be testimonials from current students and and alumni. And so today is no different. Here is uh, a word from our sponsor today, Sunshine Bible Academy. My name is Denver Paul, and I'm a staff member and alumni at Sunshine Bible Academy. Through my time at SBA, God has done a tremendous amount of work in my life, and he's used the school to strengthen me and challenge me in my relationship with Jesus Christ. When I first came to Sunshine, I was a quiet, shy freshman who had been homeschooled up to that point. By the time I graduated, I was much more confident in who I was as a believer in Jesus. I was equipped to navigate life through a confusing world with Jesus as my captain and my Bible as my compass. I came to SBA mostly because I wanted to play football. And while being able to participate in athletics was great, I had many more opportunities and experiences that were much more valuable. I built many great friendships with Christians from all around the world. I got a lot of solid Bible teaching and was able to take music, FFA, and industrial arts classes. All in all, SBA has played a big part in making me the man that I am today. So make sure you check out sunshinebibleacademy.org if you are interested in uh, enrolling. I think if you enroll before the end of school, uh, there is a discount in, involved. So if you are looking at an education option for your student, no matter where you're at in the country or the world, uh, Sunshine Bible Academy is an option for you. So head over to sunshinebible.org and uh, check that out. It'll also be in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 297. Very excited to be joined today by Jared Sorensen. Jared is a consultant and a coach with Ag Steward. He's also a rancher, and we're going to talk to him about how we can improve profitability. And so, uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Jared, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Clay, well, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Yeah, appreciate you reaching out to me. You've uh, been doing the the Ag Steward. Uh, business for a while and just recently started the Profitable Steward podcast. Could you tell me a little bit about the business and then the podcast and kind of what your goals are with those two enterprises? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So um, Ag Steward was started at the beginning of the year. We were blessed to to reach out to some leaders in the regenerative ag industry and we launched with a summit. Um, So if you go to agsteward.fyi, you can get the information about that. And, um, yeah, just, just neat when you're in this industry, you know, you're never too small. Like I didn't have a list at all when I started, didn't have anybody that anything to offer to these speakers other than just an opportunity to come and speak and share with their audience, um, kind of a, a mutual, um, collaboration, sharing knowledge. And so that was, uh, definitely a success and well attended. Um, it was a three day event. Uh, plan on doing another one, uh, at least one more this year. And, and then, you know, we thought, well, that was, that worked. And so we started doing some webinars, um, twice a month and, uh, occasionally Kip Farrell spoke last week, which was kind of out of sync, but it worked for his schedule. So we accommodated that. Uh, and so those the recordings from those webinars are being repurposed as a podcast, and that's the Profitable Steward podcast. So, so really, the mission of Ag Steward is to help family farmers and ranchers become highly profitable 
regenerate and steward and regenerate the land that they steward. Um, and that's what we want to do is keep uh, families on farms and ranches. And to be able to do that, they need to be profitable. It needs to be sustainable. Regenerative is the new buzzword, um, but you can't be regenerative unless you're profitable. And so we, I don't have all the answers, but there's a lot of people out there that are, that have things figured out. And we just want to tap into that and just kind of like what you're doing with your, with your podcast, um, gleaning from the best and the brightest, uh, and not, not those who just preach about it, but those who are actually practicing, you know, who have the, the theory and can teach it, but also the experience, um, and the results behind them to be able to show that it can be done and that it doesn't have to be subsidized along the way, either through, um, off farm income, government subsidies, or pulling out equity from your operation to keep your operation afloat. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a huge unseen subsidy. A lot of times is that, uh, pulling out equity. So could you talk to me a little bit more about what you, what you mean by that? I think all of us or many of us have been there. I certainly have been there uh, where, you know, the only way you can make ends meet is to be able to lean against the equity that you have in the land, which land is an appreciating asset asset generally. Um, And so, you know, while livestock uh, can go up and down in value, land is a little more stable. Banks are willing to loan against that, um, you know, and, up to a certain ratio. And so, uh, for four years and people just like with a home equity line of credit, you know, it's kind of like that ATM machine that keeps your unsustainable lifestyle afloat. Sometimes we do that with our businesses as well. Um, and granted, you know, equity can be a great tool. It can be a great thing if used and leveraged correctly, but if it is just used to, to, uh, maintain a sinking ship, that's really not sustainable. Right. And so, you know, if it, if, if you need to patch some holes and need to get through a tough year, like many of the ranchers will probably have to do this year when they're looking at astronomical uh, death loss on calf crops, high hay prices, just a perfect storm for an unprofitable year. That's when, you know, tapping into that can, can get you through. And that's when you hope you have the equity to be able to do that. And you have some options. If you're already tapped out in this year like this hits you, then you might not have those options. So, so that's kind of what I mean. And and you're right. It's um, to me, it is a subsidy. Uh, if it's used as a crutch, if it's used as a tool, then then and you make a good business choice and it's sustainable, then absolutely do that. Yeah, I think if it was a uh, maybe, just tell me if you agree with this. If it was part of the plan all along to use equity to grow the business, that's one thing. But if it was a reaction to something that. Uh, you didn't plan for or didn't see coming, then then it becomes that crutch that you're talking about. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, and and maybe even more so. You know, if it is if it is a fluke year like this, um, yeah, I can definitely understand and would probably advise. You know, maybe you do need to do that to get through this year. But if it's an every year deal, then then you've got to look. You got to look like okay, what's what's not working here. What do I need to adjust so that we don't have to keep eating into this equity? Um, Because, you know, sooner or later, it'll be tapped out and the bank will say, you know, there are no more options. Right. Uh, So so don't let them be the ones that have to tell you to do that. You you be proactive and say, okay, I see where this is going. Let's get some outside opinion here if we need to or just. You know, listen to the experts that are on your podcast, the experts that we're tapping into who have um, created systems that that really work. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the, uh, danger, what we're trying to avoid. Um, and, and you said that, you know, profitability and and regenerativity, if you want to use that word are kind of the keys to avoiding that, that, um, scenario. So can you kind of walk me through, uh, that walk me through some of the, the keys that you see to this, uh, profitability and being profitable? Yeah, great, great question. So, uh, you know, in the Ranching for Profit School, I know you've had uh, Dave Pratt and Dallas on and and they'll teach the three secrets to profit. And so it's it's really simple and it's the same for any business, right? Um, you know, do you, are your overheads too high? You know, take a hard look at that. Um, 
I agree. We don't call them fixed costs because they can be adjusted. Uh, but overheads are increasing, right? Um, across the board. I mean, the cost of doing business is increasing like our insurance and granted we've had, you know, had a tractor burn up and, and a couple of huge losses, but our insurance has doubled our ranch insurance over the last four years. Um, fuel prices have gone up. And uh, so price of a pickup, right? All those things that, that um, are increasing the cost of overhead. So knowing that and knowing that, okay, if this is the level at which we need to operate as, a, as, an, as an overhead and, and if we can attack those things and reduce that and be like a low cost producer, great. But at some point it's the diminishing returns. Like you, you know, you can't cut it too much. Otherwise you start to sacrifice profit. You can't starve a profit. So, so looking at overheads, looking at your gross margins, which uh, feed is a direct cost. So, you know, is your feed too high? Again, this year, it's obviously for everybody in the West, it's going to be too high. You know, we're coming out of a drought. Um, scarcity of hay, hay is super expensive. Um, <clears throat> not able to stockpile the feed. And those who were able to stockpile feed, it's covered in snow, so they're they're feeding anyway. Even those who had a, a viable plan to get through the winter without feeding. So it's kind of a perfect storm event. And so you need to have a plan in place for that, just like a you know, a drought plan, have a hard winter plan. So whether that's stored up pay, stored up cash, the ability to be able to buy that, or just knowing that, okay, you gotta, you gotta deal with those occasional unforeseen challenges. Um, and then uh, increasing, increasing your margin by, you know, uh, basically charging more for the products that you, that you offer. And a lot of the people that we consult with are moving towards direct marketing um that is one way to get out of the commodity market start stop growing commodities and start raising products that's really the best way that i see but not the only way um again i know you've had wally olson on here and um bud williams was one of my mentors so sell by marketing is a way that we can also manage what we um well, we replace our inventory with and be sure that we replace that at a profit, right? So so those are kind of the three ways. And then as as far as um, you know, as far as being regenerative um along the way, it's just making sure that your capacity is increasing year over year, right? To the carrying capacity of your operation through management. And without um without increasing exponentially your overheads, right? Because maybe you could increase your capacity if you go and throw in a center pivot or, or something. Maybe that makes sense, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe not invest in something that's depreciating. Uh, let's look at, you know, what we can do to um, to increase the perennial grasses, decrease the annual annual grasses on our rangelands and those kind of things through through management. That's, that's where I see, you know, we're really going to move the needle and not – not leaning on technology because I think that also can be a crutch, Clay. Can you give me an example of leaning on technology? Is that the center pivot or is there, are there other examples of leaning on technology? Um, I think, yeah. So that's one example. And again, not, not to pick on that, but you know, if you, if you, um, if you take it to the extreme and you know, what happens as our aquifers continue to deplete um, at some point, it's not going to be sustainable or even viable to pump water from deep aquifers on the trajectory that we're going down. So are, are we prepared for that? Right. What is that land going to be worth if that pivot doesn't turn around and around and pump water out of the ground? You know, it's, it's going to probably be worth less than the range ground next to it because it's so far armed out that there's no fertility left in it in many cases. So, uh, so it'll just have to go through succession, which nature has no timeline. And, uh, you know, it, it could take centuries for it to get back to uh, a, kind of that balanced state on its own. We can certainly speed that up. Um, so that that would be one example. The other would just be in, continually importing fertility onto our operations, um, synthetic fertilizers, um, you know, basically trying to close that loop so that we're not either exporting or importing fertility. So exporting the nutrients off the ranch in the form of hay um, 
or importing them in in the form of of synthetics and fertilizers and things like that, which as the prices go up, those are becoming less and less viable. So that's not, I mean, directly technology, but all those things are derived through technology, right? I mean, sure, you can go and mine some of those fertilizers like soft rock phosphate and things like that. But the ones that are chemically made, I don't think that that's necessarily a sustainable system in the long run. Right. And the scale at which they are uh, produced and applied is, you know, that requires technology to make that happen. Um, We couldn't mine and, you know, (laughs) mine them at the rate we are and apply them at the rate we are probably, uh, like you said, for very long or or individuals, you know, that's kind of back to that whole invisible hand of the market discussion. You know, does anybody, any one person possess all of the knowledge required to even make a pencil when you start thinking about the fact that it's got graphite and wood and paint and rubber and metal, all those things, you know, there's a co- coordinated effort that takes place to get any one of these things to market in, in, in and, those, and that's just a simple pencil. Now you, you start talking about synthetic fertilizers and those things and, and there's a big, uh, there's a uh, there's a lot that goes into getting those to market, and so as we've seen, you know, <laughs> it makes our job pretty easy when we we just have to point to the last few years and say, oh well, how what percentage of our fertilizer was was made in you know Ukraine and Russia, and and we have one hiccup in geopolitical relationships, and now you know things are three times as expensive as they were you know, just last year or whatever. And so then we are left like, oh, well, we can't do it the way we used to. We got to find a different way to to make these things work. And so uh, that can be, uh, if your business is dependent on those things, that can be a pretty, pretty hard pill to swallow. No, I think you're spot on. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that you share that perspective and, and hopefully other, obviously other people are waking up to that reality as well. And so that's good. What we hope As part of Ag Stewards, um, you know, I'm not a soil scientist, but we have access to some great people who understand soil health from a holistic standpoint. And helping to make that transition, if you've been on that chemical treadmill, that synthetic treadmill, so that you don't go broke in the process as you transition to something that is more of a regenerative without the inputs, uh, because that's that's. You know, just like a drug addict, when you go go off cold turkey, there's going to be some repercussions. And in our chemical, or I mean, our soil is basically, you know, uh, a drug addict to chemicals. So, so um, certainly the soil health consultants and those guys are doing some great work. Tap into those guys. Um, but on our team, we have William DeMille, who uh, can also help. He's been trained with Elaine Ingham. And so as far as like, building the biology in the soil which is really what it comes down to right which we we basically chased off the biology and uh so we need to create a home for them invite them back in and we'll walk you through how to do that strategically so that uh so that ideally you don't sacrifice yields in the interim as you transition um but i think you know for some of us it it just might be it just might not be feasible to continue to pour on the synthetics for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah, I would love to uh, continue that conversation maybe with William himself at some point in the future. But uh, yeah, that'd yeah, be great. I, I think that um, one of the things I've been learning, uh, Steve Campbell just called me the other day, caught me off guard, said, what have you been learning on podcasts? I'm like, I know I've been learning some things, but right now I'm not prepared to give you an answer on that. <laughs> but <laughs> one of the Steve. things, yeah, one of the things that I, I have been learning you know, is that basically what we've done with synth- synthetic fertility is told all of those underground microorganisms, we don't need you. We don't need your uh, services right now. We can we can provide all the nutrients that the root needs uh, and and or we, you know, quote unquote, all the nutrients that the new nu- that the root needs we can provide. Um, and so they they just go on vacation, don't you know, and move out as soil structure collapses, they move out, like you said, and we've got to create that home for them. You talk about guys like Steve Kenyon, you know, they, you got to put a roof over their head, you know, build that thatch layer up and and provide a spot for them to live and, and thrive. And they don't have that on most agriculture land, uh, not just cropland, grassland that if there's bare, bare ground between your plants, they don't have a place to live. And so, 
we have to go through, like you said, that process. <laughs> and nature has no timeline. So uh, talk to me about some of the people you've seen go through that process and, and how, how you've seen people succeed in that process of rebuilding that place for those uh, microorganisms to, to come back in and do their work. Yeah. Um, so on our own operation, so my, my wife and I are third generation ranchers here in northeastern Nevada. We manage two locations um, on either side of a mountain range. And so kind of my own journey was um, attending the Rancher for Profit School in the early 2000s, learning that, you know, really we're not livestock managers so much as we are grass managers. And then through my involvement with Ranching for Profit was introduced to um, Nicole Masters from New Zealand and got to to look that not only is it what's above the ground, but there's actually a whole um, herd of species that we need to manage that's below the ground that I was pretty unaware of up until that point. You know, I just thought, well, okay, yeah, I'm a grass farmer. And I wore that title proudly, but then realized, okay, really, I need to be a microbe farmer. So as I began to study that and be open to that, started experimenting with compost teas and, um, started doing foliar applications on some of our irrigated ground where we had, you know, the highest marginal reaction, meaning that while the irrigated ground makes up less than 10% of the total land that we manage, it produces over 50% of the forage. So if we could double the production on that um, irrigated ground, you know, it would increase the carrying capacity, um, our supply of feed on the ranch exponentially. Uh, so we'd gone off synthetic fertilizers kind of after I went to the ranching for profit school and realized, you know, maybe it's not necessary. And really, at first, it was just to be cheap, right? Because I thought that's what you had to do to, you know, be a benchmark business or whatever. It's not not write the checks, uh, sign the checks. And so um, as we as I, I, and it's hard to say, you know, you're aware as your awareness increases, you see things that maybe were already there all along. And so it was probably really like two parts. One, my awareness increasing, but then two, also managing for and looking for it. So as we, <clears throat> you know, I remember when I first started applying compost tea, it was like, um, here I am supposed to be managing organically. And I'm driving through my fields with this big uh, archaic three-wheeled sprayer, 80-foot boom spread out and thinking, oh, my neighbors are going to think I'm a hypocrite. He's gone to spraying and 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 so I didn't even tell him anything. I was just like, yeah, I'm spraying my field. I didn't tell him that it was actually spraying him with life and not death. Um, and didn't, you know, that first year didn't see a lot. But the next year, probably around 2015, 2016, somewhere in there. Um, I remember my my then always probably five or six years old son, Weston, was out there with me. And he liked to go irrigate and just my go to man to do anything, drive the tractor when I feed and. And, um, it's kind of all the kids did, but he, especially just anytime I'd leave the house, he was just there, you know, so jumped on the four wheeler with me and we were moving a dam in a field, uh, just spreading water. We flood irrigate our irrigated fields. And I remember going to pull that dam out and kind of right where the turnout was, I'd placed a piece of sod, um, and to back the water up. So it'd go out the turnouts further down or up the Creek, I guess. Um, and I pulled out that piece of sod and it was just oozing with earthworms. Hmm. Um, and I've got a picture of it on our YouTube channel and that's what, that's what that is. I mean, probably people don't really get it, but, um, but to me that was, it was a, it was a spiritually moving experience for me because the things that I had been doing on faith for the last couple of years, it was as if the life was telling me, thank you for doing what you've done. We acknowledge it. We appreciate it. We're here to work with you. And, uh, man, that was, that was just a neat and super rewarding experience for me to be able to see that. Now I, with William on our team, now we can measure, you know, the, the unseen things I can see the, I can see the dung beetles and the earthworms, but now we're starting to look for the fun Fungi. So yeah, we're seeing mushrooms in our fields. Um, we can see that externally, but even the microscopic fungi and microarthropods and nematodes and all those other key species that are indicative of a healthy soil. So that's kind of my own journey. Um, 
also seeing it on on large scale, even a good friend of mine, Josh Adams, who would be a good one for your podcast as well. Um, he he consults and has managed, you know, thousands of acres in alfalfa production, which alfalfa tends to be very extractive of nutrients, um, highly dependent upon synthetics. And he's been able to do that also from a biological standpoint, applying compost tea, um, strategic um, strategic minerals as needed, uh, but actually building building soil and not depleting soil, not mining soil. So, so seeing that and walking on his fields where he's seen it and looking at the side by side comparisons of, you know, the neighbors spindly um, alfalfa stems with his that are full, thick, and um, are flowering clear down to the ground mm-hmm. with you know those big leaves on them it's like okay i can see the difference i can i can see what you're saying now and then also buying his hay and feeding it and uh you know realizing that yeah there is a difference you know it's it's not just empty calories that we get paid for uh the market doesn't necessarily i mean yeah you do hay tests but does his test hay test actually better than his neighbors maybe not on the hay test um but certainly from a quality standpoint, you know, it's going to be exponentially better than somebody who's just producing volume and volume without the quality stuff. Sure. Yeah. So uh, compost teas were a big part of it. What else? What were some of the other things that have been involved in, in your journey as far as uh, moving in a more regenerative uh, direction? It's been a process, certainly, as we've gone down that road, you know, as we've implemented um Timed grazing, uh, managed grazing is a big part of it. Um, bringing as 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 much as we can, just focusing on bringing fertility in. Um, you know, when we the main enterprise of the operation is custom grazing, and so we bring other people's cattle in. Uh, we'll feed them on the ranch as much as we can because we, you know, if they'll buy the hay and we can feed it out, that's great. Uh, that's basically importing nutrients in. And then um, just kind of our protocol, you know, we no longer worm or allow the cattle to be wormed. We ask within six months before they step on the ranch. Um, So we want to encourage the dung beetle population. Um, And then also the, you know, the earthworms, this, well, not this time of year, everything's frozen, but here in another uh, couple of weeks, hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll have bare ground, but you know, you'll kick over those cow pies and you'll see, um, they'll be just eaten up from the bottom. Even the wintry cowboy pies that are really hard, you know, that don't take, tend to break down. Um, they will be. And a lot of times you'll find two or three earthworms in the bottoms of those. And so, you know, okay, um, we're not chasing off the life. And so I think that's, that's probably the biggest difference is just looking at what are we doing here? Most of what we do in agriculture. Um, and I asked this of one of my coaching clients, how much time do you spend encouraging life versus discouraging life in your working, waking hours? And he's like, yeah, it's probably two thirds, one third, you know, two thirds of the time I'm killing a weed, killing a pest. One third of the time I'm taking care of cattle or helping things to grow. So that's kind of the mindset and switching that is like all of those things, the weeds, the pests, uh, the predators, they're all just indicators of something there that's usually out of balance, right? You know, it's only a problem if it becomes in excess, like we're always going to have annuals. We're always going to have weeds. Um, We're always going to have pests, but they only become a problem when, you know, they start to, to, to diminish your production. And so, but they're not the problem. And that was what the mindset shift for me was. They're just an indicator. They're just a messenger of an underlying problem that, either I created through my management or I'm perpetuating through my management. Like I can't change what my dad and my grandpa did. Um, I think they did the best that they could. Um, And we were never huge chemical addicts, but, um, but certainly it was there. Right. And so just looking at, just looking at that, like, what do I need to do under my stewardship to change that trajectory? You know, so we're not depleting, we're actually enhancing. Let's take a break and hear from our sponsor today, Ranch Right. LLC. Death, taxes, and paperwork. Ranch Ride LLC can help you avoid one of them 
If you are a successful business, you're probably paying some taxes. But that doesn't mean you have to be stuck inside preparing your paperwork for the accountant. Enlist the team of experts at RanchRight LLC to get you back outside doing more of what you love. They are committed to providing you with actionable financials so that you can build a profitable business and create generational wealth. While some things in life are inevitable, being mystified by your paperwork doesn't have to be. If you're ready to entrust the paperwork to a team that actually enjoys this type of stuff, then visit RanchRightLLC.com and get back outside to the things you enjoy. Yeah, I think one of the things that you've you've mentioned here in, in this portion of the discussion about uh, soil, caring for the soil and things is that, and this is something I so appreciate, uh, that a guy in the position uh, that um, Burke Tigert holds is still seeking out learning opportunities. And he said, you know, early on in my career as a manager, I thought that I should be managing, uh, that I, that I should love my cows. And then I realized that if, if I, if I want to keep my cows around, I got to love my grass. And then he said, and in the last few years, I've learned that if I'm going to love my grass, I need to love those microbes, you know, that, that, and that's kind of what you're, you, you said there a bit, a will, a little bit ago, you know, is, is that there really is something more to, uh, grass production than just, uh, what's going on on the surface it it really is dependent on that stuff underground and so um you know to to hear somebody like him and in his position say that he's still learning these things and that he's seeing that underground soil life as as an important part of this success in ranching is is a pretty big testimony to uh its importance and and that we should all be paying closer attention to it so i appreciate that yeah yeah good point um, yeah, so early on, you said that one of the things that you've seen a lot of clients go to is the um, is the direct marketing. And so can you tell me or share with me some of the commonalities that you've seen? And all of this, I mean, we're, we're putting all of this under that umbrella of, of stewardship and profitable stewardship. And, you know, it, first of all, it's it's healthy soil, but then it's also a healthy business and not being a price taker. Uh, but but being a price setter, uh, so can you talk talk to me about some of the the commonalities of those that are um, doing the direct marketing? Some of the things that you've seen that they do in common that uh, that contribute to their success. Yeah, maybe maybe to their success and also to some of the challenges that they face because. You know, direct marketing is kind of the new catchy thing. People see that, you know, you're charging 10 to $15 a pound um, on these retail cuts of meat. And they're thinking, man, these guys are killing it. I got to get a piece of that, you know, cut out the middleman. Let's just go to the, let's just go market to the end consumer. And, uh, and let me, let me just say, I fully believe that that's the direction we need to head. Right. Like, I don't think that many of the middlemen have the cow cap operators best interest at heart um right now you know the jbs's cargills and those guys are that are processing we still need them um but if we can go back to more of a uh, cottage type industry system where we are marketing our products to our neighbors into our local communities that's a whole lot more sustainable then it is you know the typical calf here in Nevada, it's lightweight. It goes to California for grass in the winter, 500 miles, comes back to Nevada, 500 miles or Idaho, Utah, some um, Wyoming gets another season of grass, then goes on to the Midwest. So probably 12 to 1500 miles. And then it goes to processing. Then it probably gets shipped back to California. So how many calories does it take to produce that pound of beef? Um, I think Joe Salat, you, maybe, you know, that that's a statistic that, you know, off your head. No, sir. Uh, it's more the, the point of it is, is it, is it more than the calories that are produced at, upon consumption? Right. It, it, and so it's unsustainable, right? It's kind of like the whole ethanol here, not to get off in the weeds, but maybe to answer your question, let's put a little context around why direct marketing is important. 
Um, <clears throat> so at some point, if we had to pay the full cost of all that transportation and there weren't government subsidies, specifically on corn and soybeans, um, we couldn't afford to eat the meat. Right? They would have to change. And at some point, it probably will. So those who have the system figured out ahead of time, they're going to be ahead of the curve, just like when we dropped into COVID. Like those who had um, beef in the freezer, including ourselves, like that was an easy commodity to sell, right? You could sell beef, guns, and ammunition all day long um, during that. And and you ask many of the direct marketers, how was 2020? It would be like, that was the best year ever, right? That, you know, that's when it really kicked in. Um, and people were kind of beating down your door to be able to buy your product when they went to the grocery store and couldn't find it. Okay, so so there's the need for it. And I hope everybody understands that there truly is a need. How to be able to do that profitably, um, that's that's the question. First of all, know your numbers, right? But it surprises me at how few people uh, really know what it costs, their cost of production is. Um, and probably, you know, subconsciously, they don't want to know because, man, it would scare them. And then they'd have to do something about it. And then maybe they'd have to decide that this isn't a business. It's just a really expensive hobby that I have to keep subsidizing with the wife, with the job in town or something so that I can do what I'm doing and feel good about it. But face that, you know, know your numbers. And if numbers don't lie, um, and and we certainly can help you to do that, you know, from, a, from an outside perspective. And sometimes that's what it takes. Um, and at least knowing like how to be able to run an enterprise budget and know what it costs you to produce that. So, um, so from there, you know, if you determine, okay, this is a profitable enterprise, which is probably what you should start with, right. Then, then start building that market. Um, and so what I encourage people to do rather than go build fancy websites and stuff is just start sharing your message organically, share it on your social media platform, see how many people it resonates with. And it's not so much about your product. Like everybody says they've got the best grass fed beef in the world, including ourselves, right? We raise it. It's natural. Uh, we believe that because of our practices, you know, it is good. And, and we do have some data to back that up, but you know, why are they going to buy from you versus somebody else versus Costco grass fed, which was raised in Brazil or whatever, organic, all the labels that it might have in the world on it. It's going to be because of your message. So message comes first, then making sure that message aligns with your mission. And then third, monetizing that. So sometimes we want to jump and we want to skip to the monetization. It's like, let's build a fancy website. Let's put a bunch of face. Um, at market spend, ad spend towards Facebook ads. And, but if it's, if our message isn't in alignment with what our mission is, um, the monetization is not going to happen. And so get it in that order, really dial in your message first. And so that's what I've encouraged people. Um, I'll give a plug here for my good friend, Cam King, grass fed marketing secrets. Uh, he's done a great service to, to uh, the cow calf producer, to be able to help them to dial in like some of the things that we don't really like, like the marketing and stuff, you know, and he's got scripts for coming up with emails and a system that if you just find it, follow it blindly, like you'll, it's almost a guaranteed success. So um, yeah, did that kind of answer your question, Clay on that? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Uh, you know, and I, <laughs> yeah, I was just, just signed up for a new um, kind of service. I see the need for, uh, writing better ad copy as I've gone out on my own and started courting my own advertisers. I, I want to help them or at least, uh, or be able to write better ad copy for them. If they say, Hey, you do what you want as far as this advertising spot is concerned, you know? And so I, and, and as I was going through this continuing education, uh, course on ad copy, one of the first things that they said on there is, uh, the people don't buy the best product. They buy the they buy the product with the story that resonates with them the best. And so I think that's kind of exactly what you just said, right? <laughs> Is yeah. that get your message right first, you know? And, and so um, can you give me an example of that messaging first mission second kind of, I've got my messaging dialed in. Now I'm going to line my mission up with that. Can you give me an example of that? 
Um, yeah, I guess, you know, obviously you look in the mirror at the, for the first example and, and that's, um, with ag steward, it's not my first attempt at building a coaching business. Like I actually started in 2012. Um, <clears throat> but it, I didn't really know who my people were, my avatar, as they call it in marketing. It was like, yeah, I can help anybody. You know, anybody and everybody. And and when you learn in marketing is that you need to focus on that one person, like the more dialed down you can get on it and the more you can call out that person. So there I am family farmers. I really like to work with couples that are in their early thirties that maybe inherited a place or are trying to buy a place or starting out with leased ground. Like those are the people that I feel like I can really help. They're hungry. They want it you know, they're committed to it. They're old enough that they, um, they face some failures. They're not young and naive, fresh out of college. They have some experience and they don't even have to have a college degree. And in fact, in a lot of ways, it's probably better if they don't, because then they don't have to unlearn all the garbage that they learned in school. Right. If they, if they've gone out and they've have an entrepreneurial mind and they're committed to it, man, those are the kind of people that I really want to work with. And, uh, and so in my marketing, Like that's my messaging is around them. You know, I, I'm a Christian. I'm not afraid to say that I believe in God. And so again, I'm calling out. Okay. Um, And I'm also kind of pushing away the people who maybe that's offensive to, right. If I talk openly about my faith in Jesus Christ and they're atheists, it's not that I don't want to work with them or not willing to, but if, if it doesn't resonate, it's not going to maybe work as well. So so that's a big part of it. So as I, as I've done that and then just practice. So my mentor told me to get on TikTok and do a live every day for a hundred days. Um, I'm like 60 days into it, I think. So I'm past the tipping point. I can't say it's getting easier, but it wasn't to market. It was for me to get clear on my message. Hmm. So that's what I've encouraged people to even, you know, people that want to sign up for a, a marketing program. I'm like, you'll get there but let's get some traction first with your message. Let's make sure people are interacting with it organically before you do the paid stuff. And let's get really clear and just keep practicing it, you know, seek every opportunity to be able to share your message. Um, Because I think all of us are messengers, even us reclusive ranchers, you know, that are introverts, like this is not my deal, right? This is, this is so much bigger than I am. And that's the reason I'm willing to step up to it is because it's, it's not about me. It's about the people that I serve. And so I have to get past the pride and the ego and the just wanting to be, to go hide in a tractor or on a horse or, you know, do my own thing, not be seen, which I think is a big part of marketing too. Right. Um, the more vulnerable, the more real you can be, the more authentic, uh, the more you're going to resonate with other people. Yeah, it's striking to me how much these business principles uh, relate to ranching, and and I mean, <laughs> shouldn't be right, uh, but we have been conditioned uh, to not treat our our ranches as a business, to subsidize it as a lifestyle, and say I get to live this lifestyle, so I'm I'm willing to put up with lower uh, returns for for my efforts and my labors. Um, but then when you when you when you make that shift of saying no, I want to make money, I want to make good money doing this. Uh, and you start to look at it as a business and say, what what should I do uh, as a business person? And and you run smack up against these three secrets for increasing profit, you know. And then you start to see realize, oh, well, that's just every business. Every business is is their three secrets are the same: reduce overheads, increase turnover, increase gross margin per unit. Yep. You know. And like you said, can't starve profit into a business. So maybe not so much that needs to be done about the overheads unless they're really out of hand. Uh, and then so we turn our attention to increasing gross margin per unit. That's getting paid more for what you produce. That's being a price setter, not a price taker. And increasing to turnover, that is healthier soil that allows me to run more animals on the same number of acres. Boom. Then we yeah. turn our attention towards the, the, mar- the messaging side of that conversation that we've had here. And I didn't know that it was relevant to to agriculture when I started out. When, but when I started the podcast, I went out and I found education resources for podcasters. And what's the first thing they tell you to do is to niche down your message. 
target your message at an adv- avatar, like you said. And, you know, I can help anybody in ranching. And what was the net result of that of that adventure where you said, I can help anybody? It wasn't successful. Then you, you niche down and you say, I want to help first generation 20 and 30 year old couples who are trying to get started on lease land or, you know, inherited land or whatever the case is. Boom. And you've got it niched down and you're focused. And so I think that it's just so, so cool to me how these business principles are. I found my, I found it in podcasting and I found it and then I find it in other places, you know, and it, their principles for a reason because they work wherever they're tried. We can apply these principles to multiple different sec- sectors and find success. And so I think that that's kind of what I hear you saying as far as, uh, how you are applying them specifically to your sector, but they could be applied to any sector. Yeah. Spot on. Yep. Well, good, good summary of that. (laughs) Yeah. No, again, I I think it's just something that it continues to these, (laughs) all these guys that I've been talking to for the last five and a half years on the podcast, what they've been saying continues to be confirmed as I, as I venture into my own building, my own business and, you start to see it everywhere and that's how you know it's a principle is that it's it's everywhere it's it's true uh outside of it doesn't just apply to your now the application of it the practices are different of course because we have different contexts but principles are first then practices come later after principles are set down so yeah hey, you've been stealing some of my material that's like really good stuff all right well no. expound on that then tell me how i just stole your material <laughs> I mean, no that is i i've taught that in my classes also you know when people are no naysayers and they say well that won't work here mm-hmm. and they're like okay well you know gabe brown is a great cover cropper and we've tried and tried to implement cover cropping here i um, in our perennial pastures um with no success i mean limited success but what is the principle behind that? Why is he doing that? He's encouraging diversity of species above ground, diversity of root mass below ground, and then in diversity of biology. And he also has a diverse um, uh, herd that grazes at above ground of chickens and, and sheep. And, and uh, um, I think he's still got sheep and cows. So uh, can I do that on perennial pastures? When I asked him the question, he's like, well, you know, why do you need to cover crop if you've got perennials? That's the, like the species. And I said, well, because I need to increase my production, you know, I'm pouring out water. These are my irrigated fields and I'm only getting two to three tons of production. I believe it has the capacity to do that with seven ton. And so, you know, maybe I'm looking at the wrong tool, the wrong practice. The practice would be cover mm-hmm. cropping. Right. And I, and I took that as a principle. Right. The and principle thought, okay, is diversity. This, the principle is yeah. diversity. The practice is cover crops. Right. Yep. Yep. I didn't mean to yep. interrupt. Keep you can keep going. No, that's <laughs> that's perfect. I mean, I think that summarizes it. That's that's an example to me. I haven't given up on cover crops. Like I still think that we can do that, especially because we don't have a, a lot of warm season grasses here. So I'd really like to learn how to when our cool seasons kind of uh start to slow down in the hot. Like we don't get super hot here, but you know, could we could we stitch in some sorghum sedan or some warm seasons in there that would really crank it if we still have the water to put out there? So yep. so I haven't given up on it, but again, with the with the you know the foundation of the principle behind it of like increasing carrying capacity through diversity and through proper management, also right because. If we do all the practices in the world, even like compost teas and things, um, and yet we still till and we still overgraze, it's kind of like you missed the point, right? It's like, do they, they all have to be in harmony. Um, the principles and the practices ideally have to be in harmony. Otherwise you're just going to meet with frustration. So, and, and, you know, in reality, there's probably something that I'm missing, and I'm I'm sure and Gabe hasn't ever been on my ranch, you know. That we I've just been on his webinars and asked him questions and and things, and he could probably point it out if he were here. But it might not be as meaningful and it as when I find that solution myself, because once I go through the challenge and the frustration, 
then I can relate a lot more to somebody else. You know, whereas if it just came easy, like if all of my, all the seeds that I'd planted had grown, maybe I wouldn't be able to relate to somebody else who's struggling. And I, and I think that's true with any principle, right? When we look back in retrospect on our lives, like why did we have to go through depression, foreclosure, having a son sent home from his mission because of depression, um, celiac disease, Lyme's disease, some of these things that has gone through our family. Like when you're in the middle of it, it's like, I don't know why, but now just like Steve Jobs says, we can't connect the dots in the future. We can't connect them in the past. So if you have that perspective and you start to look back and now as I'm coaching and mentoring others, it's like, okay, it's starting to make sense now why I need to go down that path. Cause I can come from a place of empathy and understanding when somebody else is dealing with depression. I mean, I can see it oftentimes before they do, just like somebody saw it in me before I did. Hmm. Right. And they were able to point it out. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's the real value of like having a community, having a coach, having somebody, a mastermind group. Um, Cause we're often blind to those very things that, you know, are right in front of us. Somebody else can see it. If they're too quick to point it out, like we might just reject it. So sometimes it takes some patience. It takes letting them kick against the pricks, letting them fight their head, letting them feel the pain. And then when they're ready, you can offer it to them in a way that they accept it as their answer. Just like with horsemanship, right? You know, if your horse, if you're always giving the horse the answer, well, he's a pretty good trained robot. Whereas if you're teaching him, and letting him find it and bump up against the pressure, then he'll appreciate it a lot more and he's going to work with you. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> I I think that's a, a big deal there that, you know, it, it has to become their aha moment. Basically you can't, you can't talk somebody into an aha moment or, you know, they have kind of like that. Um, the moment you said you pulled that piece of sod, you know, out of that outlet, you know, and you see yeah. those, those, you've got to have there's got to be a whole set of circumstances leading up to that point that can create that because a lot of people could have pulled that out of there just another clump of sod with some earthworms in it but it, you were set up for that process to be a meaningful s situation and, and i think that that's we can't necessarily uh we can't necessarily talk people into uh those those scenarios they've got to come to them on their own and we've basically what we're left with then in that scenario is uh we have to have the patience to keep showing up and let them come to those conclusions on their own does that match with your experience yeah absolutely i think you've probably seen that as a parent and um you know if we if we rob our kids or those that we uh mentor or or advise in any way from that opportunity we're doing them a huge disservice like if we point out the answers too quickly, um, especially if they haven't asked the question, right? And so sometimes it's really hard to sit back and just like, I want to tell them. But again, you've probably seen that with your kids. Like, you know, we will tell them and then pretty soon they move out of the house and they are working with somebody else and they come back and they tell us this great piece of advice that they heard from somebody. And it's like, I'm pretty sure we told you that at least 10 times but they weren't, they weren't hungry for it. They weren't listening. And so really it's just, uh, it's a fine balance, you know? And, and I think that's how God is with us. I'm sure he's looking down on me and thinking, man, Jared, why do you have to fight your head so much? You know, the answers are just right there. If you'll just be humble and be submissive, like I can help you and I'll, I'll teach you, but you got to ask the right questions and you got to quit thinking that you know it all. Um, yeah. So just a, a huge dose of humility is what I think really what it takes. Um, but at the same time, the confidence, right? It's, it's not like you can't, you can be humble and you can be confident, like be confident that we are created to be stewards, that if God's given us these stewardships, it's not to crush us. It's so that we can rise to the challenge of being a steward. And if we feel that it's greater than us, then we need to grow ourselves. Right. And not because those another principle that I share is that our stewardships come into balance with the steward. And so, you know, I've kind of used that comparison of stewardships on one hand, steward on the other hand, if they're out of balance, they will seek that equilibrium. But what our challenge is, is not to 
shed off the stewardships that are greater than us. It's to grow the steward so that we become equal to the stewardship. And that's kind of one of the core message of Ag Steward and what I help people to do. Like we get them in and we talk about profitability and we talk about production. We talk about all these things that are sexy and fun and, you know, the pain points. But when it comes down to it, it's helping them grow the steward in themselves so that they can rise to the stewardships. If that's in agriculture, great. Maybe God has a different calling for you. You know, maybe he wants you to go serve people in another part of the country. And but if your identity is tied to I'm a rancher, you're not willing to step away from that then that identity is going to, um, there's a huge cost with that, I guess. It's kind of maybe the best way to put that, right? <laughs> we may not really feel that a full weight of that until later in life. And we look back and we think, oh, that's, that's maybe what I was called to do. And so that's kind of how it's been with me, you know, is running from my mission at first, instead of just saying, yeah, this is greater than I am. I am not equal to this task. Like it scares me to think mm. that I can be an influencer and I feel the weight of that, but yet I realize it's not me. Right. All I have to do is just show up and apologize when I screw up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I think that the, it goes back to that idea that we've all got influence. It's just, how are we using it? You know, I mean, uh, it's, it's not whether, uh, but which, <laughs> That's a that's a theological statement, right? It's not whether you will worship God; it's which God will you worship? Because we're created for worship, and we can't avoid it. Um, yeah. And it's not whether you'll be an influencer, but which influence will you will you uh, put out into the world? And so um, you are you are influencing people around you all the time, uh, whether you're a parent or not. You're influencing people around you all the time, and so what, which kind of influence are you going to? to have on the world. And so, uh, pay attention to that and, and, uh, get yourself equipped to, as you said, uh, rise to the stewardship level that you, you know, that you have been, that, that is available to you. You know, there's the the task, hopefully the task does feel bigger (laughs) than you and, and you are intimidated by it because then you will be forced into dependence on, on, Someone, in in my case, uh, the eternally self-existent second person of the Trinity, Jesus and his Holy Spirit, uh, come and, and help us when we come up against those, those uh, challenges that are bigger than ourselves. And so we have, to, we have to become dependent on him to help us make up the gaps in our own and continue to become more. Uh, he's faithful with a little will be entrusted with more, right? I think that's kind of what you've been talking about there. So, yeah, yeah. talk to me a little bit about your stewardship, uh, the Ag Steward business. We we started there, <laughs> and then kind of yeah. talked about, yeah. kind of fleshed out what it is, what is profitable stewardship. Uh, but talk to me about how somebody could get into a coaching relationship with you, and and kind of what what they might expect, and and some of those things. Yeah. So- uh, two two invitations to your listeners if this is at all resonated with you. Um, so first of all, uh, if you go to agsteward.fyi, uh, there's a link there to be able to download a free PDF copy. And, and it's a novel that I wrote, which um, you can't really see it in there, but viewers can't see it anyway, or your listeners can't see it anyway. So it's, uh, it's searching for home, finding grace. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting that you talk about Jesus Christ and that... Um, through him, all things are possible. I did not start out to write a uh, relationship book or certainly a book about my belief in God and in Jesus Christ and in following the spirit. But that's the message that I needed to share through this book. And uh, so there's an element of romance in it. It starts out as a someone who from the city comes and works on a ranch. He's divorced, looking for himself, basically. And so hence the name searching for home. And then the subtitle finding grace is what came to me, you know, about two thirds of the way or halfway through the book and not, um, not grace, the person who is the involved in the romance, but, but a double meaning there of, Mm -hmm. of grace through being able to forgive himself, realize that his past mistakes no longer need to define him, that he has an identity regardless of, what he has done 
um, or, or even what he will do, even his char- current character flaws. And so that's the, yeah, that's kind of where I was able to pour my heart and soul and mess my message into those pages of the book. And so invite people to read that. It's again, it's there's the ranching principles in there that people pick up. Young people tell me, you know, it's a great book. Other people say, man, that was a good testimony of Jesus Christ. Other people say, you know, that was just a really good story. Um, so whatever, it, whatever it is, it's a, it's a very influential book. Um, so I encourage you to, the link, there'll be a link on there and then we're going to add a link. So I'll just keep it simple. Again, just ag I look for the assessment link. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the best place to start. It's just a simple Google form. Don't be intimidated by it. It just asks some questions about where you're at in your business, what your goals are. And then we'll uh, jump on a call for like 30 to 45 minutes and just walk through that assessment, see where you're at, see if it's a good fit to work with ag steward and a coaching scenario. Um, maybe identify some of those blind spots that, that you might have towards your business. And uh, we really love to work with people and help them. And, you know, I can't guarantee that it'll be the right fit to work with us, but I, I feel like I can guarantee because so far I've been able to do it in every call that I've given is give you a clear next step of what you can do, you know, and even if it's recommending you to go work with somebody else like Cam King, if like you're just on fire about direct marketing, I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll make the introduction. You go there, you know, you put your effort and energy into that. So very good. Yeah. Appreciate that. We will uh, have links to that in the show notes page for today. Working cows.net slash two nine seven working cows.net slash 297 is the show notes page for today. And we'll have links to uh, ag steward and uh, the profitable steward podcast. So uh, Jared, thanks for your time today. Hey, again, it's been a, it's been a pleasure um, to everybody who's out there listening. I just encourage, you, you know, we're living in some very turbulent times and uh, but with all that, um, kind of my message is you can find peace if you know where to look for it. Like it, it's probably not going to be on social media or, you know, maybe, um, in the news, right. Maybe even you want to turn those things off or turn them down in your life a little bit and, and seek for some of those things that are eternal. And so I appreciate it, Clay, that you're, that you're willing to go there and talk about true and eternal principles, timeless things that will help people throughout the ages. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I know it. I don't, I'm not as disciplined as I should be about it, but I know that social media companies make money by uh, keeping us uh, engaged, which I think is because we're mad, or as I like to say, we are, if you are enraged, you are engaged, Um, you know, and so they, they show you things to upset you and keep you scrolling and clicking and the, the other media companies, it's all about fear, right? All media, all engagement in media is uh, fear-based. They want to make you afraid so you keep watching or keep clicking or keep scrolling so that you will uh, stay stay on the platform and keep the advertising dollars coming to them. So um, we once we know that, then we can then we can understand why am I seeing this now and uh, maybe like you said, unplug <laughs> a little more and 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 go search, right? <laughs> the kingdom yeah. of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man who found it sold everything he had to buy that field so that he could have it and we need to we need to sell some things that probably are in our <laughs> that we are that we're holding on to and and spend a little more time examining that that uh, treasure hidden in the field. So yeah, pearl of great price also and just what it, what is where is that pearl? So, yeah, man, that's, that's why your podcast is great. You know, it kind of slows the mind down. Right. And so we're not in that fight or flight, um, adrenaline, uh, mode that social media puts us in and, you know, just listen, pick up a good book, read, listen to some music, get out in nature, do those things that are going to help and ground us and kind of slow our minds down and, and help us to be not reactive to the situations that we're in. And, and again, we're facing some challenging times and I know that, you know, from a biblical perspective or just any, everybody's got feel tells them the same thing. Like, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know what's coming, but we kind of have that gut feel that like, man, things are things, things could fall apart fast. 
relatively speaking. But bottom line is, even if they don't, you know, even if the economy stabilizes, aren't we going to be better off if we do these things anyway? Yep. So, yeah, I think that's fundamental to the medium of podcasting is the ability to pause, rewind, listen again, (laughs) you know, and you're not, you're not over. Right. You didn't get it all the first time. That's okay. It's recorded. And, and what, what a great time that we live in that we have access to all this truth and information and don't let it overwhelm us, but you know, kind of let their conscience guide to where we need to go instead of just um, our habits and addictions of, you know, those endorphins that we get when we're scrolling and stuff. So. Sure. Yep. Awesome. Very awesome. good. Jared, thank you for your time. Yep. Thank you, Clay. Blessings to you and your audience and everybody out there. Very good stuff there with Jared. Really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know him. Uh, would encourage you to uh, be su- be subscribed over at patreon.com slash working cows. Uh, there's opportunity to get swag delivered to you. There's opportunity to get bonus content. Uh, Jared and I had a quite lengthy uh, bonus conversation after this episode recording concluded. So uh, really enjoyed that conversation as well. And it will be up at, at patreon.com slash working cows in the near future. Uh, also, uh, up there probably by the time this releases is an early release of a future episode, because I think there's some timely information in there that I, I, I would wanted to give people access to ahead of time and, uh, get, give them an opportunity to hear that episode in advance so that they could make any decisions they needed to based on, uh, where we're headed as far as moisture patterns are concerned for this, the rest of the spring and summer. Um, you know, obviously (laughs) this is not marketing advice, but, uh, I think it is, um, it is interesting stuff with Don Day, who is a private meteorologist and, and has an interesting perspective about the pre- predict- predictability of moisture patterns and drought. So encourage you to head over to patreon.com slash working cows and check that out. Coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast is that episode with Don Day. So you get it a week early if you want to hear it at patreon.com slash working cows. So I encourage you to head over there and check that out. And we will see you again real soon with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.